We're going to talk a little bit about moral knowledge. And in particular, we're going to talk about objections or problems for moral knowledge, people who are worried that we can't have moral knowledge. So let's first talk about what that even means, what they're really worried about. So let me give you an analogy. Before microscopes, we couldn't really know as much as, at least as much as we know now about microscopic features of the world. We didn't have knowledge of those microscopic features. Now, did they exist? Yes. So saying that we don't know anything about them or that we don't know a lot of stuff about them at that point before microscopes is different from saying that they don't exist and they're not operating in exactly the same way that they currently operate now that we do know about them. So we want to separate these two issues about microscopic entities, what they're like and whether we can know what they're like. Okay. So that's uh, on the first hand, a metaphysical question on the second hand, a epistemological question or a question about our knowledge, right? Similarly, when we worry about moral knowledge, we're not asking whether there are moral entities or moral facts or moral claims or whatever. We're asking whether we can know about those moral facts or truths or whatever, or properties. So the person who's worried exclusively about moral knowledge is not trying to argue that there can be no moral properties or truths or whatever, that nothing can be right or wrong, just that we can't know what's right or wrong or good or bad, virtuous or vicious, whatever. Okay, so that's the debate. Now, why would anyone worry that we can't have such knowledge, moral knowledge, knowing what's right and wrong, what's good or bad? Well, we're going to talk about two arguments people have had. There's a whole host of these arguments. We're going to talk about two that have been particularly influential. Okay, let's look at the first one. So on the right-hand side, we have a graphic um, representing something most people know to be happening in America right now, which is political polarization. Uh, over the past 20 years, and probably more if you extend the timeline backwards, and probably more, much more past 2014, right? 2014 was before Trump, and so uh, we've probably had much more political polarization since then. So what's this trying to show? Well, we disagree with each other about political and in many cases moral matters much more than we ever have, or at least in the recent past in America. But that phenomenon is a particular phenomenon of a much more general thing that's happening, which is there is tons of moral disagreement in the world. Republicans and Democrats disagree about whether abortion is permissible, but uh, different cultures in the world disagree over even bigger things, like whether it's permissible to kill someone because of their gender or race or something like that, right? And we look at historical disagreements where we contemporary people disagree with some group of people. Uh, historically speaking, we disagree with huge numbers of people uh, from say 200 years ago in American civilization about the permissibility of slavery. And in fact, many cases 200 years ago or slightly less than 200 years ago, people were arguing not only that slavery was permissible, but that it was a great thing, it was good. We ought to be doing it, right? For the good of these people. Those were the arguments. Now we have a deep moral disagreement across time and we have deep moral disagreements within a particular time because there are other cultures that have those same beliefs now. We have less deep but still fairly deep disagreements even within our own country on things like abortion, gun rights, things like that. And these are all moral disagreements. Okay, now a lot of people worry they worry that because we have such deep moral disagreement, that means we can't know anything about what, what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. Why do they worry about that? Well, you might think that when you disagree with someone and you have no reason to think they're any dumber or less informed than you are about non-moral stuff in general, that should cause you to doubt yourself. So let me give you all an example. Um, Suppose that you disagree with someone about the number of planets, okay? So you're talking about the planets and they say, well, there's 
seven planets and you say, well, I think there's eight. Well, actually, let's not get specific on the case because you're gonna have your particular convictions about uh, how many there are. Uh, let's say you just disagree about the number of planets. Now you talk about it, you get clear on what you mean by planet, you talk about your sources. It turns out after you talk about it for a long time, you're both equally still convinced that you were right. You say this many, they say a different number. And it turns out that they've done just as much schooling as you have. They went to a comparable university or high school or whatever. They've taken the same sorts of classes you have. They've watched the same sort of, I don't know, National Geographic, whatever the shows are on TV that talk about planets. And so you're well informed. You're both, uh, you know, you, you clearly are around the same level of intelligence, background, experience, etc. What should you do? Now, a lot of people say, there are people out there who say, well, you shouldn't do anything. They, you should just stick to your guns. But a lot of people say, well, you should at least become less confident in your answer. And if you don't, you're being irrational, right? So imagine if that one doesn't stick with you because you're just so confident about the number of planets, imagine you perform some um, relatively complex mathematical operation. You're uh, deciding the tip at a restaurant, for example. And you both think it should be 20% of the ticket, um, but you don't, you disagree after you do the calculation, right? Now, uh, you both redo the calculation. You both still disagree. And it's not a huge disagreement. One of you thinks uh, 555, one of you thinks 565 should be the tip that is. Okay, so what do you do? Now, this is your friend. You know that they've had, they're just as smart as you. You're about, the same intelligence. You both have, have had about the same kind of training in math. You Maybe you were even in the same high school and college classes together. You made the same grades, blah, blah, blah. What should you do? Well, a lot of people would say you should at least become less confident in your answer, right? And some people say you should actually both suspend disbelief or sorry, suspend belief. You should actually say, well, I don't know whether which one it is. I'm no more confident now in 555 than 565. Because after all, why does it matter that the answer I came to was one of those when someone else came to a different answer? It seems like if you privileged your own answer, it would be some kind of prejudice or bias. Because what's really relevant is that one person who has the same level of intelligence came to this answer, and one person who just happens to be you came to a different answer why privilege your own answer over anybody else's? So they say, well, you should just suspend belief. You should flip a coin or something like that if you have to. Okay, so if that's right, if you're kind of on board there, then you can see exactly how we end up in a similar position with regard to morality. We disagree with people on moral matters. And at least in lots of cases, this is a disagreement between people who are equally intelligent and equally informed about non-moral stuff. Right. So imagine the abortion disagreement and the people argue back and forth and they actually end up agreeing on all of the science. This is what happens at 18 months. Sorry. <laughs> this is what happens at 18 weeks. This is what happens at 22 weeks, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they, they both have had all the classes and all of the, uh, the education that they need to know what's going on in, a, in the womb and with a baby, et cetera. And that they still, and they have equal levels of intelligence and all this they still disagree about whether abortion is permissible in a certain case, let's say uh, before or after 20 weeks or something like that. Uh, this would seem to be a similar case just to the, the, the calculation case or the planet case. And so if you thought, yeah, you should become less confident or, or maybe as far as you should suspend belief, then um, you should suspend belief about, your, about whether abortion is wrong or not. And as it turns out, you're going to find somebody in the world who's about as smart as you, who disagrees with you about basically every one of your moral beliefs. So goes the argument. And so really, you don't have any moral knowledge. You ought to abandon all your moral beliefs. That's how the argument runs. Okay, so let's talk really briefly and evaluate this argument real quick. So the first premise is the claim, the general claim about suspending belief when you disagree with someone who's about as smart as you and kind of has the relevant background knowledge as you. Uh, you could deny that. You could certainly deny that and say, well, no, I mean, the, you're not prejudiced in your own favor when you take your own reasoning for granted, as opposed to the other person's, because you have access to evidence and to reasoning that they don't, 
or, or, and you don't have access to their reasoning, right? So you have access to your reasoning and the calculations that you've done. They're looking at their, their calculations. Is it prejudiced to prefer your own? No, because you have access to the reasoning that you went through to get there and you don't have access to there. You're just hearing their uh, conclusion. So you might say, you might deny this first premise here and say, no, I don't think that uh, you should suspend belief when you disagree with someone or what's called an epistemic peer, someone who's kind of on the same level as you. That's one way that you could challenge this argument. On the other hand, you could deny that there's as much moral disagreement in the world as the argument proposes. And you might say, yes, we do have a disagreement about abortion in America, but we need to talk about the depth of disagreement, right? So we do disagree, that's certain, about whether abortion is permissible, but what does it mean to talk about the depth of disagreement? How deep does that dis disagreement go? Well, clearly some of our moral beliefs are based on others, right? I think, if I think that abortion is wrong, it's because that I think maybe it's wrong to kill um, an innocent human being. And that it, belief itself might be based on another, another deeper moral belief. I believe it's wrong to kill an innocent human being because I think it's wrong to kill a, in, an innocent sentient being and human beings are sentient, something like this. And eventually you get down to these principles that you just believe, uh, even though they're not based, those are your fundamental moral principles, right? Now, sometimes we have surface level disagreements, even though we actually agree on the deeper moral principle, right? So if uh, we disagree about, let's say a soldier kills a civilian accidentally in a battle, okay? Um, you might think that was wrong and I think it was permissible. Um, and we think we have a disagreement, a deep moral disagreement, but really it's because we actually disagree on some non-moral stuff. We agree that soldiers shouldn't intentionally kill civilians. And you just happen to think based on your read of the situation that the soldier intentionally killed the civilian. But I think that the soldier didn't kill the civilian intentionally. It was an accident. Okay, but we actually agree on the deeper moral principle that you shouldn't kill a civilian intentionally in war. And we just disagree on some non-moral empirical stuff about whether that, whether the soldier intended to kill someone is just something we can find out by doing some science, maybe some psychology, maybe do some interviews, whatever. That's not a moral disagreement, right? So our apparent moral disagreement really boils down to, it's not really even a moral disagreement, right? We actually agree on the principle. We disagree about something that's going on in the soldier's head or what he perceives or whatever. And similarly, this could be the case with abortion. We might actually, and this is probably true in many cases, we agree that you shouldn't kill an innocent person. That's the moral principle. And I think uh, anti-abortion and pro-abortion people agree on that. You shouldn't kill an innocent person. But where they disagree is whether the fetus at whatever, whatever stage is a person, right? So that's the question. Um, now that really kind of boils, now personhood is a little bit of a moral concept, but it's further from a moral concept than, uh, than something like wrongness or rightness. And so you could see how lots of our moral disagreements are gonna really, or our apparent moral disagreements are really gonna boil down to uh, empirical disagreements. They're not really moral disagreements. And so we actually agree on the deeper principle in that case, you shouldn't kill an innocent person. Okay, so you could deny two in that way. We actually don't have moral disagreements as much as it seems like we do. And in fact, we, across cultures, maybe you even wanna say, agree on a lot. So disagreement is not gonna challenge all of our beliefs, even though in maybe in some cases we ought to abandon a belief. Okay, so that's the argument from disagreement. Let's look at one more argument before we tie up. This is the argument from irrelevant influence. So let me talk to y'all about an experiment that some people, some scientists have done with a certain kind of primate called bonobos. Uh, they've done lots of different kinds of experiments here, but let me talk to you about one. So turns out, uh, I can't remember the exact fruit involved. I want to say it's grapes and bananas. These monkeys, they like the grapes more than they like the bananas in, uh, in this particular case, at least. And they've got these two monkeys in cages next to each other. They can actually, each monkey can see what's going on in the other monkey's cages and what the researcher in front of the book cages is doing. So both monkeys have access to all of that information. It's, you know, just kind of wire cages that they can see through. And in the first case, the researcher gives 
the first monkey a piece of banana. He's happy. He gets it. He loves it. And then he gives the second monkey another piece of banana about the same size. That monkey's so happy. He gets it. He wants it. Whatever. They're both happy with the banana. In the second case, the researcher first gives the banana to the first monkey, but then gives a grape to the second monkey. And when the first monkey sees that the second monkey got a grape, he throws his banana out of the cage. Now, what the researchers want to say about these cases is that the first monkey has a concept of fairness, right? Because he actually likes bananas. So why should he care? You know, why should he throw the banana out when he's going to get more enjoyment out of the banana than having nothing at all? Well, it's because he perceives that he's been slighted. The other monkey got something that he didn't, and he doesn't see a difference between the two of them, so it's not fair. So he throws the banana out in protest. So uh, this is part of an ongoing research pr program that, you know, kind of spans a few disciplines, trying to argue that some mammals outside of humans have kind of proto-morality, kind of an early version of morality. They have some moral concepts um, and they act on those concepts often. But why is this important? Well, it's part of a general case that's being made that morality and our sense of morality evolved, right? Here's another piece of that case that's a little bit more intuitive and not research-based. It seems like a lot of our moral beliefs, just kind of in the abstract, would be very advantageous to have from an evolutionary perspective. So I, for example, believe, I have a very, very strong belief that I have a very, very strong obligation to take care of my kids. And I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to, even in many cases, sacrifice myself if I have to, to save my children. I haven't had to do that yet, thank God. But if it came to it, I'm sure that I would, and most parents would. Um, we sense, we have this deep moral belief in that claim that we have a moral obligation to um, take care of our kids. Uh, and that includes a lot of different things from the everyday to the self-sacrificial. Um, so you don't have to think very hard to see why evolution would select a belief like that if it was in the business of selecting beliefs at all. Because the evolution is in the business of trying to, well, in very, you know, non-scientific terms, evolution is trying to design beings that pass on their genetic material. And if you're trying to do that, of course you're gonna be able, if, at least if you're in the business of putting beliefs in these beings' heads, you're gonna design a being that says, I really, really have to take care of my kids rather than one that doesn't have that belief. The, that is the first being, the first human is going to be much more likely to pass on their genetic material. When the train comes barreling at your kid, the being, the human being that has that belief is more likely to have a kid who survives than the, the other one, the one that the human being that doesn't have that belief. Okay, there's a lot more going on here in terms of the empirical research. It's really interesting, but it's all part of a cumulative case to claim that our moral faculties and our moral sense and our moral beliefs even maybe uh, evolved. They were the product of evolution. And really in the story I just gave you, whether I ought to take care of my kids uh, that belief that I have doesn't seem to have anything really particularly to do with whether the belief is true. I didn't end up with the belief because it's true, right? I didn't evolve to believe that because it's true. I just evolved to believe that because I'm more likely to pass on my genetic material if I do believe it. Put that alongside a different kind of belief that we evolved to have. I've evolved to believe, um, let's say in this particular setting, look, here's a little box for a, a little lapel microphone that I ordered. Now, I obviously believe that this is in front of me, right? And I've evolved to have those sort of faculties and the ability to recognize when this is fr in front of me, okay? Now, the interesting difference with the moral case is that I evolved in such a way that I believe that this is in front of me only when it's in front of me. When it's not in front of me, like now, I stop believing it. So my belief seems to, I've evolved to believe it only when it's true. And obviously it's only advantageous for me to believe it when it is true. That's the really important part. So maybe here's a more relevant example. Here's a big nail. Uh, when I moved into my house and started remodeling, I found a bunch of these around. The people who lived here before me didn't clean up basically anything at all apparently. Here's news for you if you didn't know it. Apparently, it's not like a, when you rent an apartment. When you move out of your house and sell it, you apparently have no obligation to clean all your crap out of it. So I found a bunch of these. Now, 
it's clear that I have an, there's, it's advantageous for me in terms of passing on my genetic material to believe that there's a big nail in front of me when there is one, right? Because if it's pointed at me and I don't believe it and I run my eye into it really hard or something like that, I can maim, maim or kill myself, right? But it's clearly only advantageous to believe that this nail is in front of me when it is, right? When it's gone, it's actually advantageous for me to not have that belief because I don't have to, you know, go out of my way or whatever. It doesn't clutter up my thinking. So our beliefs about, you know, external objects, three-dimensional objects, things like that, we did evolve to have those beliefs in some sense, so the story goes, but we evolved to have those beliefs just when and because they're true. Whereas with our moral beliefs, we evolved to have them not because they're true, but because it's just going to make us more likely to pass on our genetic material, regardless of whether they're true. So you could sum all of this up by saying there's an irrelevant influence or a non-truth tracking influence, if that makes more sense in your head, on our moral beliefs, right? It's as if you said, well, I'm going to decide what to believe by rolling a dice. Let's say an 80 sided die. So I, I roll a die and I let that determine what I believe about some unrelated matter, like say, whether it's gonna to rain tomorrow uh, or how many inches it will rain tomorrow. So that it's gonna be similar to the moral case according to the objection. If I decide what to believe based on a die roll, uh, that die rolling has nothing to do with the truth of the matter. And so it's an irrelevant influence on my belief. Now, you might think, when your beliefs are purely or even mostly the result of irrelevant influences, you, they really can't be trusted. And so you don't know those things. And so that's the way this argument goes. Our moral beliefs are the product of an unreliable process. Uh, they track advantageousness and not truth. And so for that reason, we don't know anything about morality and what it's like, right? One writer on this subject has likened it to this, they said, suppose you um, set out in a, a boat from Florida to, I don't know, let's say Cuba, but you just said, you know, I'm just going to kind of roll a die or, you know, flip a coin every morning to decide which way I turn. Are you likely at all to land at Cuba? Very unlikely, actually. Very unlikely. Um, because your path has nothing to do with the truth of the matter. And similarly, evolution is kind of selecting for our beliefs, regardless of what the truth of the matter is, even if there is, like in the microscope example from the very beginning of this talk, uh, even if there is a truth of the matter, morally speaking, we're unlikely to land at it just on the basis of evolution influencing our beliefs. So we shouldn't trust those beliefs, right? Just like we shouldn't trust that the person setting off from Florida is actually gonna hit Cuba if they're deciding the turns based on a coin flip. Now, okay, let's talk about how to respond to this argument if you think we do know stuff about morality, for example, and it's important to think about this. It's important because I don't at least want to give up my moral knowledge, right? I think it was wrong uh, for Stalin to commit genocide, for Hitler to commit genocide. I mean, for all of the people who have committed genocide to commit genocide, and I think I know that. If these arguments work, it looks like I have to say, well, I don't know. I mean, who's to say? Who's to say whether Stalin's genocide was wrong or not? Maybe it was perfectly fine. Maybe it was good. Who's to say whether slavery is wrong, right? Maybe it was okay. Maybe it was actually good. Maybe they should have done it. No one wants to say that. So what's wrong with the argument then? Well, again, technically you could. You could dispute premise one here that evolution has influenced our beliefs. Now, no one wants to deny that evolution has influenced our beliefs, but you could deny that evolution has influenced our beliefs strongly enough to make us, to make it like the, even just the primary influence on our beliefs, right? Obviously there are other influence on influences on my belief that the nail is in front of me. For one thing, the nail itself is an influence on my belief. It's causing me to believe that the nail is here. Uh, similarly, some people might want to say, well, maybe there are other influences on our moral beliefs. Maybe the moral facts can influence our moral beliefs, just like the fact that this nail is here influences my belief that the nail is here. The nail itself is making me believe in the nail. Uh, on the other hand, 
you could deny the second premise too. You could say, well, actually, no, just because some irrelevant influence worked even primarily on your belief doesn't mean that you don't know anything, right? Now, that's a little harder of a bargain to sell, but some people have tried to argue that. Okay, but those are two ways that you could respond to this argument. Uh, and like I said, I think it is important to get to that point uh, with regard to both of these arguments. I don't think, now, maybe you, you could endorse a kind of relativism to get out of these. So you could say, well, there is a fact of the matter that genocide is wrong. That's another way to respond to these sorts of arguments is just to say that they only apply to sort of objectivism. If you are a relativist and you say, well, genocide is wrong, but that's just because I believe so. That also allows you to get out of these arguments. You can have moral knowledge if relativism is true. So that's the way, a way in which a view about moral epistemology can depend on your view about moral metaphysics. So you think there is a fact of the matter about whether genocide is wrong, but it's totally dependent on my attitudes. Um, and that would be equivalent to saying in the second, the argument from irrelevant influence that you actually could get to Cuba by flipping a coin if the location of Cuba depended on the coin flip, essentially, right? That's what's being said in the relativism case. So if, you know, you, you had some mysterious island that showed up wherever, it's like the room of requirement in Harry Potter, right? It shows up wherever the coin flip is going to make you turn, right? Then you're going to get to that island. And similarly, if you're, the moral facts kind of are going to arise and depend on whatever attitudes are evolutionarily selected for or wherever you end up, morally speaking, then your moral belief process is going to be reliable kind of regardless of what influenced it. So really these are these two arguments against moral knowledge are arguments against moral knowledge if you take a sort of intuitive objectivist view. So that's another a third way you could respond to both of these. But it's important to realize if you're not a relativist about morality, if you do want to say I don't care who you are, genocide is wrong or slavery is wrong, then you'll need to take one of these other responses or more particular responses to one of the two premises in these, this argument or both of these arguments.